It's May 3rd, 2021. This is Rook. She is a kid from Tehran who has become a New York Times best-selling author. Jasmine Darsnik is an Iranian-American lawyer, professor, and writer who made quite an impact on the literary world about a decade ago with her debut book, The Good Daughter, a memoir. In it, she told the harrowing and touching story of her mother growing up in Iran and her hidden life. Since then, Jasmine has published two more critically acclaimed books, including her latest, just released, a beautifully written novel called The Bohemians. She's thoughtful, funny, and has done deep work on identity. Jasmine Darznik joins us today. Plus, we have your letters about Batman Kobadi. This is stories from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gia Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode number 107 of Rook. Salam, Dustan Aziz, Mizuni, Mizuni, Mizun. Khoshomadin, Omira Hastam Ke, Mizun Bashin. How's it going, everyone around the world listening in? We are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're coming to you on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, CastBox, Telegram. Jasmine Darznik will be joining us in just a few minutes from San Francisco. You know, if you're sitting out there somewhere um, wanting a reading recommendation, a book recommendation, having uh, just devoured two of her books, I will heartily recommend Jasmine's work. She is... She's just an exceptional writer, and um, her first book about being Iranian and her mom, uh, it's really one of the best memoirs. You know, there was this moment about 15, 20 years ago where um, a number of memoirs came out, uh, Middle Eastern memoirs, Iranian memoirs, uh, that immigrant memoir canon. This is one of the best I've read. She is just fabulous. Her latest book is called The Bohemians. It's set in America, actually in San Francisco in the 1920s. Uh, it's transporting. She has the ability to transport you with her words. And this book is oddly prescient, like it's set 100 years ago. Uh, but uh, the more things change, the more things stay the same. She, you know, it's there's a rise of right wing nationalism. There's a, a pandemic. There's a, you know, so uh, it's it's quite interesting. Um, well, it's more than quite interesting. It's a fabulous book. Jasmine Darznik coming up. Speaking of fabulous. Mm-hmm. Hello, the fabulous Keon. Hi, you just sold me on both her books. I'm going to have to pick you those must, up. You must. You must. Can I sell you on the microphone, which Please. is just close to your face? <laughs> that you can sell me on that. There, too. that's even better. You're a good yeah, seller. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, just speak into the microphone and everything will be fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Keon. The fabulous Keon. Yes, yes, get it right. Uh, yeah, no, you've got to. I mean, yeah. I really want you to read these I books. Must. They are just, uh, it, it's, so, it's so much fun. When reading books, when someone is a great writer, oh, you know, yeah, you just yeah. lose yourself. It's a huge talent. And I, the first, when I read her memoir, okay, she's Iranian. There's ways, you know, we're of the same vintage. I could, yeah. you know, maybe you could say I'm identifying with uh, with the words. But uh, this latest book, The Bohemians, that's just come out is actually, it's the story of Dorothea Lang, an mm-hmm. American photographer. Uh, a great American photographer, uh, this woman. Uh, and it's set in the 20s, as I say, in San Francisco. I mean, mm-hmm. there's nothing about that that I should necessarily <laughs> find right. to invest in. Yeah, and yeah. yet I was so consumed in the story. Beautiful. Yeah. All with her words. And Jasmine's had quite an interesting story of her own. Born in Tehran, uh, came to the West in the 80s. You know, uh, her mom has quite a story. We'll get into all of that. I'm looking can't forward wait. to talking really to her. Wait. Yeah. Uh, hello, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. And Groovy Shia. Hi, hello, yes, sir. You have grown your, it's seemingly overnight, you have a beard. <laughs> You're like a Persian Chris Christopherson. <laughs> Do you know who that is? 
no. It would shock me if you did because it's an old reference. Yeah. Look up Chris Christopherson, a very handsome yeah. singer songwriter. You want to do it right now? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, handsome singer songwriter slash movie star from the 70s. Chris Christopherson. Uh, oh. And, you know, he's always was rocking oh. the beard and a star is born. <laughs> and, you know, you're like the Persian version. <laughs> oh, oh, he's handsome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. he's oh, very he handsome. That. As are you, Shai. Yeah, you are. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, combine uh, Chris Christopherson with Osama bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> you get some. <laughs> no. Actually, Shia looks like one of those ancient Persian statues with the bearded men. He, he, he really does. Like he does. Very he mighty. Yeah, you always. look mighty. Yeah. I, Shia, is, he's got that look in general. Yeah. A very, a it's a very beautiful yeah. face. You look like a philosopher oh, now. Yes. I really want to listen humbled. to your wisdom. Yeah. Well, you, uh, <laughs> you're her suit. That's the word. Her suit. Her, su- her suit. Her suit means you're a hairy person. Uh, Pashmalu. Uh, Pashmalu. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I think that's what they had in mind when they came up with the word her suit, but it was easier to pronounce for white people than Pashmalu. <laughs> But it's uh, a talent to grow a beard like that overnight. I, I can't. Say. I'm not a very. I'm not a hair suit person myself, yeah, unfortunately. So I don't. I don't have that kind of hair. But uh, it takes me a while to grow this uh, peach <laughs> fuzz. Uh, but uh, the shy, yeah, he's yeah, like a the talent. You know, you, you ever seen a chia pet? Yeah, you know, those things you water <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they grow. The plant grows. Shy is like that. Yeah, yeah, he exactly. just gets some add some water to his beard. Kian says it's a talent, as if like shy has been working overnight. <laughs> it's beard. impressive it's to me. Like genetic, <laughs> Kian. I don't know. It looks good. But Shia, you know, it's true. He's been he's good looking no matter what. Yeah. Now Captain Reza, <laughs> the shockingly good looking oh. without the beard. Oh. I'm not a fan of the beard on Captain Reza. You I know like that. Well, it suits both of them. I don't know. You what think it is. so? They look more mature. Like I, I want to mm. pay attention to what they have to say. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, in that case, I don't know if that's an insult or a compliment. <laughs> you weren't paying attention before. <laughs> no, but it's very common. Women really like it. They find it. Yeah. That, like men with beard is more manly and it is, women have been telling you this well one woman okay well that's good, good, enough for that's me. good. <laughs> but you have a very handsome face i feel like you are you it's I, what am i it's the whole show is <laughs> talking about how handsome these guys are but your face is very it's it's like a classic handsome guy and then it feels like you're covering it with the beard i don't to me it makes no difference like with uh-huh. the beard without a beard if his I, girlfriend I know, likes it that's enough that's all that matters, yeah, that's eh? All that matters. Would you grow a beard for your boyfriend, <laughs> Keon? I am not, if I was capable, perhaps, if he was into that. No, but if your boyfriend, <laughs> but if your boyfriend says, uh, Keon, I want you to have short hair, would no, you do it? No. no, you have to be happy with yourself too. Uh-huh. I don't know, Reza, you're happy with yourself, right? Yeah, easy. Okay. Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't care as much. Like I'm pretty, I'm okay, pretty you're flexible. Easy going. Yeah, okay. very, no, that's very great. Easy going. Lucky. It starts yeah. from you. Whatever you're happy, and then that's right. You, mm-hmm. yeah. That's right. Are you yeah. happy with yourself? I am quite happy. (laughs) Good for you. (laughs) Are you happy with yourself? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) It's a a riveting conversation. (laughs) Uh, You know, we've been getting the most. I wanted to. I wrote this down. Make a point of the letters. Mm -hmm. We've been getting the most wonderful mail. Uh, we something happened. Vivian, something I, happened in recent weeks I where we got, we was. went from just people writing <laughs> shitty things to yeah. us. To, <laughs> but it, 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 I mean, we've always had nice letters from right. you know folks, but uh, but just great great notices, great people really paying attention yeah, to the show, re- yeah. reacting to things, suggesting things. Yeah. Um, anyway, I got this letter. I think it was on Instagram from this person named Tina. She may live. I think she lives in Northern Ontario, based okay. on the address. She's a Persian woman. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't tell exactly where she's, but she's, I think she's in Canada. Okay. But she talks about, uh, I love Rook, it's great, It's my. I'm addicted, and it's really nice. And then she said, are you gonna have Tara Tiba on? Mm-hmm. Now Tara Tiba yeah. is, uh, do you know who Tara Tiba is? Oh, I who love you? her voice. She's an Iranian jazz artist. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. incredible. She's in Australia right now. Okay. And, and funny enough, We've been in touch with her right. to come on the show. Actually, we've been talking to her for a while now. We yeah. just haven't uh, scheduled it in. So I write back to this person who's in Northern Ontario, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where she is. <laughs> but I say, hey, uh, thanks very much. Great. You're, you know, you're right on because we actually are talking to Tara Tiba, and I think she's going to come on the show soon. I can't wait. So you know what this person writes back? What does she say? No word of a lie. What did she say? Hamas <laughs> Karadon. No. <laughs> That's a true fan. How do you like that? I love it. Hamas <laughs> Karadon. <laughs> so good. Now, I, 
I've been telling people this weekend since I got this letter because yeah. I was so excited. Of course. Little background for those who don't catch every episode of mm-hmm. Rook. How dare you? But here's the <laughs> here's the background. My dad, who was from originally from the Desful Ahvaz, was mm-hmm. born in Abadan, the south, you know, okay. that area. Yeah. We're talking about, I mean, he was born, you know, last century, probably the, at the time in the 1930s, 1940s, Iran, they were, it was an Arabic area. Mm-hmm. So we're yeah. not sure where this word came from, but uh, I remember my dad throughout my life saying, throughout his life and my life, saying, <laughs> Hamas Karanat. And um, I mentioned this on the show a little while ago. Everyone was scrambling around trying to find out what it means. We couldn't come up with a definitive uh, definition for it. However, I am suggest I'm, I'm imploring that we're going to use this to mean awesome, which is what Tina from Northern yeah. Ontario did. Yeah. You know, in honor of your father. You're going to have Taratibon <laughs> Hamas had a lot. Imagine you know? it catches on. I, oh hey, man, God. it is going to. I'm on a mission <laughs> now. It's I'm on a mission father. now. I <laughs> want so like weird. somebody. I want some random. I want like a, you know, <laughs> kiosk band to be on stage in Germany and uh, be like, hey, Hamas had a lot. You know, I just we're going to get this going. We're going to get it going. Your father will be so proud. You know why? We're gonna get it going because it rolls off the tongue doesn't yeah. it don't you want to say <laughs> it's a hard word to say it, in the beginning <laughs> but when you think it you know. and it's one of those words that white people <laughs> wouldn't be able to say it like, no, <laughs> that's right it's got, it's got okay, secret I'm code okay. yeah. secret code embedded in it like, <laughs> I, I need water every time I say it that's the listen uh, I, and it's so expressive in so many ways you know uh, like you're, you're kind angry, of you're sad, you, well you're I don't know about angry I don't want to use no, a frank I want it to be positive Positive. But I I like the sort of like uh, uh, yeah and and the, the the film got five stars. Hamas got on that. You know, you can kind of you don't know if have to always spit it out. It can be smaller. Gentle, you know, Hamas. Yeah. Oh, Hamas. Oh, your girlfriend likes the beard. Hamas got on that. Like good on you, buddy. You know, that's so cool. That's uh, so great. I was so happy when I saw that. Yeah. There's a now that's, that's right. this we're making an inroads. Forget <laughs> that's right. this I thought the show was created. I thought this was about celebrating, you know, forging an identity. It's yeah. really about getting my dad's old lexicon <laughs> that nobody understood, you know. Uh, you see that you're making a difference. <laughs> yes. Love you, Dad. If you like what we're hearing, uh, if you like what you're hearing, <laughs> also if you like what we're hearing from each other, uh, we'd love you to become a patron of Rook. Uh, rookmedia.com is where you go. That's the website. Rookmedia.com. Press on support us and you can become a patron for five bucks, ten bucks a month. And then you get a special uh, honorary status and prizes and 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 the show stays alive. Keon? Yes. It, I, honestly, no. uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for you to say Hamas Karana. Hamas Karana. There you go. (laughs) But also, I wanted to say it's a way for us to stay independent because the last thing we want is to be bought out by another big network. Listen, we're doing this on our own. We are staying committed. We're doing the right thing. The last thing we want, unless they're offering... (laughs) A lot of money is to be bought up. By, sure. Wasn't it with Bahadur Alast? Where it was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I will like, never, I will money. never take a sponsor for my. What he's got this Coca-Cola. amazing YouTube site. Yeah, yeah. What if Pepsi offers you ten million? Well, uh, I mean, okay. let's, well, let's, okay. let's not get ridiculous. I'll take the money. Uh, yeah, but uh, you're absolutely right, Keon. Mm-hmm. That's a great way of putting it. Is we we do want to stay as independent mm-hmm. as we can and not sell our souls. Uh, we'll have sponsors. We'll have you know. But in terms of actually selling our souls to a uh, some massive corporation that tells us what the guests are going to have to be yeah. or and that massive corporation being a big network yeah it would be uh preferable if we never have to do that right exactly rookmedia.com keep us independent uh become a patron of rook we'd love you too it's five bucks a month is not a not too much to ask uh in the coming days on rook uh dr angie sadeqi merdad isvandi the Disney creator on Thursday, he's coming up with Persian yoga. Rana Mansoor wow. is, uh, wow. yeah, the fabulous, of speaking of great female uh, Iranian singer songwriters. And, um, and a band that, uh, you know, I have to confess has been relatively new to me. You guys who grew up in Iran would know them like the back of your back of your hand, of course, because they, uh, since the '90s, have been among the forerunners of of playing traditional Persian folkloric music. A band called Rastok. Oh yeah, Rastok. You know, know them, Shai. yeah, I know them. Yeah, 
Do you have you have you heard this band? I haven't. See, no. I think it's okay that we didn't know them. We grew up them. in the West. We grew it's up in the West, different. so I spent the weekend looking at their YouTube. First, there's there's a hundred people in this band. Wow. Yeah, I mean, there's the main. Uh, I'm gonna have three of them on the uh, in the okay, interview, okay. but uh, there's a there's a number of people, yes, you know. Yes. And, uh, but it's amazing watching these guys play. It's fantastic. They're like. Uh, they're like the talking heads of uh, folk music, of Iranian <laughs> wow. folk music. It, there's women, there's men, there's oh. you know different instruments. They're 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 all ex- it's excitable. It's uh, it's very interesting, oh and um, it's our traditional music, yeah, right, from our fol- ancestry. Folklore. Yeah, yeah, it's all folklore. I am music. sold. I need to listen to this yeah. music. <laughs> you know, I was saying, uh, you know, you look at that in English, and you go, "Is that Rastok or Rostak?" Uh-huh. And I was saying this to somebody on the weekend who was, uh, she was pointing out to me that in Farsi, if you were to read that, you would know because of the way it's written, yes. you would know it's Rastok. Mm. Yes. But in English, it's impossible the, to yes. tell. Sometimes when Keon's reading the letters or we're yeah. going through it and, and, and you, Shia, suggested, I mean, it's, uh, so yeah. sometimes it might seem obvious to you, mm-hmm. but if you look at R-A-S-T-A-K, right. how do you know uh, if it's Rostak? A lot of times it's the way A, a- Alif is written, right? Am I that's right? right? It's yeah, either that's right. A or A. Uh, so when right. I, when it's I, when obvious I, in Farsi. Right, yeah, when I'm yeah. reading in, uh, for, uh, Persian names, for example, it's hard for me to distinguish which mm-hmm. one it is, so that's why Shia a lot of times. But you see, like, for example, the band Rastak, if they would spell it R-A-S, talk, T-A-L-K, then you'd yes, like it's not it's not yeah. spelled phonetically no. or or some other kind of R A A some something to kind of but yeah like I look at it and I go I I had to ask is it yeah. Rostak is it Rastok mm. uh, and then of course people roll their eyes when you get it wrong oh, and you know it's man. a disaster. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> they, they but anyway, understand. Rastok yeah, coming yeah, on yeah. Rook, Hamas <laughs> Karanot, <laughs> right? That's on that's full on Hamas <laughs> Karanot. You know they're a big band. Um, and finally, I know before we get to Jasmine Darznick, we have some great letters. Beautiful we talked about letters. that. Beautiful. And this, you're going to focus, you were telling me before the show, uh, today's letters on the Batman Kolbadi yes, episode. Yes, absolutely. And I have to say, reading these letters was such a pleasure. Just completely, so much emotion and passion was written into these letters and uh, anyway we'll get to we'll those. get to those the letters of the week uh, are one week ago we had uh, uh iranian kurdish filmmaker bahman kolbadi on the show and and it has become i believe it's one of our if not our most one so. of our most streamed episodes ever Absolutely. and we, we just keep getting mail about this and um yeah. so we got to have them on every week or something honestly, at, this, yeah. at this rate yeah. you know and if, if for anyone that hasn't listened to the interview i insist you listen because it was really really beautiful it was such a pleasure to listen to all right we'll get to the letters of the week that's the fabulous key on captain reza and groovy shia let's get to our feature guest my feature guest today is an iranian american author who was born in tehran left with her family as a kid around the time of the 1979 revolution she is a former attorney and she received her phd in english from princeton university and she has been a professor of english and creative writing for a number of years at institutions including princeton washington and lee university and university of virginia but it is as an acclaimed writer that jasmine darsnick has come to public recognition around the world. Jasmine published that first book, a memoir, in 2011. It was called The Good Daughter, A Memoir of My Mother's Hidden Life, and it became a New York Times bestseller. Her critically acclaimed second book, Song of a Captive Bird, based on the life of trailblazing Iranian poet Fudu Farakhzad, came out in 2018 and was a Los Angeles Times bestseller. Jasmine has received fellowships from the Steinbeck Fellows Program, the Bennington Writers Seminars, and the Corporation of Yaddo. Her work has also been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Now Jasmine has released her third book, The Bohemians, a beautiful new work of historical fiction based on the life of one of America's most celebrated photographers, Dorothea Lang in the wild years of the 1920s in San Francisco. This new book is already getting rave reviews. And by the way, in her spare time, Jasmine is also a professor in the MFA in writing and literature programs at the California College of the Arts. But right now, Jasmine Darznick joins me from the San Francisco Bay Area today. Hello. 
Hello. So great to talk to you and be here with you. Thank you so much for doing this. I have been consumed in your work for the last couple of weeks, having read two of your three books, your first and your brand new one. And it has been so gratifying as you are a, a truly an exceptional writer. It's, it is consuming work. It's, it's educational. It's inspiring all at once reading your work. And it, uh, it makes us proud to have someone like you in the diaspora. So I'm grateful to be able to do this. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I And I likewise am very proud of you and just so glad to get this chance to talk to you. By the way, you're a lawyer, a professor, a <laughs> PhD, and a best-selling author. Do you think that's good enough to earn the star Persian overachiever badge or do we need to do more? <laughs> Is there more to do still? Yeah, you know, my mother, I'm sure, would have more, um, you know, she'd like more <laughs> added to that list. But um, absolutely, I mean, she's my my mother was a really, um, you know, she's she's really been the driving force behind all those degrees and and is now my biggest fan. So thanks for all that. <laughs> I, I, I'm just dreading when my mother hears this interview and says, <laughs> Bebin, lawyer, va PhD, get after. And, you know, it's just like, okay, great. Now I yeah. have to live up to Jasmine Darznick. Um Jasmine, I want to get I want to get to your brand new book, your new baby, The Bohemians, which I I found to be spectacular. The story of Dorothea Lange, uh, and who she was. But having also just read your first book, The Good Daughter, which is a memoir, I feel the need to start with who you are. I know you've said you're fascinated by origin stories. Well, your origin story is quite fascinating itself. In The Good Daughter, you write that when you initially came from Iran as a child. Shame was your first true native instinct that, as you put it, nothing was right about me in America. Mm. Is the publishing of a fabulous new book that is a most American story evidence that you have finally overcome that shame that you now fit in? Mm, probably the real question is when that feeling will recede. I don't feel like it's entirely, I don't feel entirely at home. I don't feel like I've overcome that shadow yet. I'm not sure that I ever will, but I have gotten better at doing my work in spite of it. Um, I think it's, it's something at the core of me, that feeling of never quite being at home or fitting in or knowing that my place is secure or certain um, and and yet that's the place from which I write and have become somewhat comfortable writing out of that place of of a kind of ambivalence or ambiguity it's amazing eh? like the um, Princeton PhDs acclaimed bestsellers uh, even writing about America writing about San Francisco in the 1920s can't shake that feeling huh I guess not I mean these these experiences of childhood really do <laughs> they really do implant themselves in us embed themselves in us and and yet really I really do feel it's also the source of creativity for me it's not for nothing that so many at least in America so many of our great American writers have been either children of immigrants or immigrants themselves because that that feeling of not quite fitting in is also that space where you observe, where you begin to, you look critically at what's around you, and that's really productive for a writer. So I, I, I think on a personal level, it's not quite comfortable, but I, I absolutely know it has a lot to do with what I write and how I write um, yeah. and why I write at all. I get it. I, let, me, let me stick with that childhood experience with you for a second. Your mom basically single-handedly for the most part ran a rundown motel in the San Francisco area when you had arrived in the United States. This is through the 1980s and people would ask where are you from and she would sometimes answer Germany since your mm -hmm. father who was often absent was originally German. People would often see through that. The immigrant shame runs deep, eh? Uh, passed on from generation to generation. It does. And, you know, my mother herself didn't feel it. I mean, she's really, <laughs> my mother is pretty impervious to, to other people's opinions of her. She's a really um, strong, she has a very strong personality. But as her daughter, I really took in people's responses to her, to us as a family. Um, I, I tended to absorb all of that while it just kind of pinged right off of her, <laughs> but people's responses to her. And then also, I mean, I have to say the other part of the part of the story is the our, our place in the Iranian American community here in the Bay Area. So the shame was also 
for example, that my mom was very careful about who knew what about what she did, you know? Right, right. So she, so the thing that's, you know, I'm so proud of now is that she single-handedly really supported our family through her work there is not something she shared readily with her friends because that was for her a source of shame. Um, she, she grew up in that world where, you know, really a woman didn't <laughs> work and then, you know, those, those attitudes absolutely followed us. And, um, and so it was also that feeling of shame about, you know, what people in our Iranian community could know about us, could yes, know about me, yes. you know, all of this, I'm sure it's incredibly familiar to you or any Iranian. There's something that's actually very familiar to me that, uh, I mean, so much of this, but something that really hit me in The Good Daughter. Uh, and it's a little thing, but it's the little things that sometimes are the most profound. It's when you have arrived in America and you start elementary school and there's another Persian girl named Ziba and she's mm -hmm. sweet and she wants to connect with you. But after a while, you end up ditching her to befriend an American girl. Um, t tell me about that. Yeah, I'm so. Speaking of shame, I'm ashamed of that now. Having I haven't thought about that in years, but of course, when I was young, when I was uh, in elementary school, I had you know I was so so hyper conscious of how other kids looked at me. And when she came, when this with when this girl who was much more recently arrived um, than I was to America came, it was like you know this embodiment of everything I was trying desperately to hide. Now there was a comfort because she was me, you know, I, I really, I, I'd look at her eyebrows and I saw myself, you know, right. but, but, but then it felt like, you know, the stakes of that friendship felt too high in my child's brain, you know, I had to disassociate with her, and, from her, excuse me. And, um, and so I pulled away and, you know, I, I, I still have a, you know, now I have a feeling of shame about how, cruel I was in rejecting her, but it was absolutely about rejecting that part of myself. And in a way, it was about survival for you, right? It, it was. I, and, you know, again, this is a child's brain, but it felt, it felt like survival to a nine-year-old me. It, it's those early years in America where the notion of the good daughter is first introduced to you. Uh, can you explain what it means? There's another riddle. <laughs> so when I was growing up, my mom would often say, if you're not a good daughter, you know, if you're not my good daughter, I'm going to go back to Iran to where I have a really, I have a truly good daughter, you know. And I, I just thought it's one of these, you know, one of these things that she's saying to try to keep me um, behaving and, and keep me, you know, acting like a good proper Iranian daughter. But it turns out she did, in fact, have a daughter whose identity she really sh shielded from me until I was in my mid twenties, um, and found out by accident that she'd been by yeah by accident pretty much that she had been married, and she later told me the full story. But it was um, it was a sort of specter as I was growing up, is all the things, all the ways that you're not measuring up uh, by becoming American, you're widening that distance between the ideal, <laughs> the, the daughter you should have yes, been, the daughter yeah. you should be. But even if there wasn't, and I'll get into your mom's story, but even if there wasn't that that other daughter in Iran, there'll be people listening to this who are familiar with the expectations that come from the cultural sort of be a good daughter and the contradictions in what are expected of you, like many immigrant kids. Because the other part of it is when you were in Iran, as a little kid, your mom would call you Arusaka Farangi, like the, uh, <laughs> the foreign doll, you know. The suggestion would be that you're special because you were somehow Western, but when you're in the West, you're not Iranian enough. It's like you can't win, right? <laughs> it's so true. I, I think that when we came to America, we became more Iranian. My mother became more Iranian. And this, I think, is fairly typical is there's a line in The Good Daughter where I say something to the effect of the preservation of our identity fell on the shoulders of the daughters, right? So yeah. as we were losing our, our Iranian identity as a community, or it felt imperiled because suddenly there was you know, us and them, insider, outsider, that all of these, you know, feelings of loss and despair around that loss got hoisted onto the daughters who then had to fulfill all the expectations. Now, I, I know the sons got it too, but when it came to, to, let's say, withholding, you know, a certain ideal of Iranian womanhood, you know, it, it was, you know, it was absolutely as 
profoundly a force in my life as it would have been, I think, if I was growing up in mid-century Iran, you yes. know. Um, so in this really weird way, we became more Iranian and it became, it was definitely a source of a lot of grief in my life because I could never, I could never meet that. But also you're, you're in America and you're dealing with what's externally coming at you. I, when I was a kid in, in, in Canada in the, in the, in the same period and my, uh, my reaction shamefully, you know, in, in, in retrospect was sometimes to be quite angry at my dad. You know, why do you have such a heavy accent? Why are we so different? All of that. And you have this kind of parallel where you, where you often as a teen and, and in those early years, you'll respond to your mom in an argument and say, this is not Iran. Uh, right. <laughs> even though you are Iranian, uh, you, um, t- tell me about that that impetus to want to distance yourself from the place, in fact, where you were born. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I really hated her a lot of my growing up, you know, and I and I tended to do this thing that I think is is also pretty typical is I conflated her with the country and the culture. Right. <laughs> so, you know, what I hated about her, I presumed was. Iran was Iranian. And there's this line actually in a book I love called Woman Warrior, where she says, how do you know what's culture and what's just your family craziness? <laughs> you know, <laughs> And it, for me, it was really hard for a long time. I could not draw a bound or border between those two. I just thought that those two things were one. And, um, and so thankfully, you know, with the years, I've been able to, you know, kind of tease them apart and see that some of what she was that I thought was intrinsically Iranian had more to do with the particular circumstances of her growing up. Um, and I was able then, you know, I went to college, I went to UCLA, where there were so many Iranians, I don't know if you know that world yeah, in Los Angeles. Yeah. But that was, that was really important, too, because suddenly I had an alternative um, source of information, I was able to look at other Iranians and begin to remedy some of this, you know, anger I had felt toward um, Iran and being Iranian. So I had a lot of Iranian friends, and I was able slowly to see it, see it as a source of inspiration and, and strength, too. So I'm really very fortunate that um, that I had that opportunity to, in, in a sense, remedy my, <laughs> my, you know, the, right. what I felt were the wrongs of my childhood. By the time you go to UCLA, you, you've heard the refrain, make something of your life from your mother uh, continuously. But, <laughs> but you, say, you, you say it was not entirely clear what she meant other than medical school. You, you end yeah. up becoming a lawyer. Did you think you would like being a lawyer? Never. I, it, it, there's nothing about me, my personality that's suited to the law. And I have friends who have flourished and I, I have a lot of respect um, for them, but it just wasn't for me. I knew that I was really young when I graduated from college. I was 20 still and I was 23 when I graduated from law school. Wow. And so in, in a way, it felt like an extension of undergrad. It wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily thinking I would do this forever, but it did feel like something I had to do. To, to please my family. But there's a lot of contradiction because I think my mother never entirely expected me to support myself. She didn't, she didn't. I think the ideal was I'd get this degree, but then it, the degree would be kind of one of the, <laughs> one of the attractions that would lure the doctor husband, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So, <laughs> so that was sort of her vision for what education um, was, was meant for. It was to make you more attractive on this um, marriage market. So I, I, I thought, I think that's a point where you say you're either supposed to be a doctor or marry a doctor marry or one. ideally you're both. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I disappointed my mother terribly um, on in every direction. And when I decided to get a PhD, it was like you're running away with the Grateful Dead. You know, it was like <laughs> <Right>. that <laughs> outrageous. Right. The PhD <laughs> is you're doing it, what? Yeah. Although Iranians do value education, right? So the PhD <laughs> has, does have status, doesn't it? They do and they don't, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, I, it was definitely something she loved to brag about and still still does. But, uh, you know, if, if, if pressed, um, no, I mean, she she would have far preferred me to be a lawyer and, and go that more, you know, just a far more lucrative profession. Yes, for one money. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Money. Yeah. Becoming an English professor and, oh, my God, God forbid, becoming a writer. That was just... <laughs> No way. Well, Jasmine, it's it's when you're at Princeton getting that PhD 
that your writing really takes off. And it is based on a memoir you end up writing. Your first book becomes the New York Times bestseller. And it's inspired by a photograph of your mother that you see. Now, forgive me, I know you've told this story many times, but uh, explain to folks who are new to you at this point what what you saw in that photo that would change your life, basically. Yeah, so, you know, I I had had, there was a lot of bad blood between me and my mother when I, And then graduate school, we were pretty estranged by that point. My father passed away pretty suddenly in my first year of graduate school. I came back home and I was helping her pack her things up. She had to move house and I found this picture of her. I knew it was her. I could recognize her. And she was dressed as a bride. Next to her is this man who's not my father. So it's a man I've never seen before. It's, it was, you know, I, it was just, so confusing and strange and yet you know I think now that I think about it part of it made sense you know it I think there'd always been there's there'd always been this mystery about my mother and um and and I think in a sense finding that photograph and then when she begins to tell me the story of it it makes sense that she had had this past this this uh you know, really traumatic past that she'd outrun. And then we wind up, you know, really at her, with her blessing, sometimes with her urging, we wound up spending a couple of years talking about her life story. I spent time in conversation with her, and then that became the basis of this memoir, which... um, which you're talking about just to be clear that the, in the photo she's a kid or she's i mean she's oh, yeah. 13 or 14 years old and she's in a wedding dress and and i guess you you ask her about it and her initial her knee-jerk reaction is to dismiss you and kind of say i'm not going to talk about this and that goes on for a while and yeah. then as i understand it she starts sending you tape recordings tell, tell us about that Yeah, yeah. So my my mom was living in California. I returned back to the East Coast to resume my studies. And she and I don't have a written language, really. She's never, her her English is fine, her spoken English. But I think in some ways, that was also a familiar, familiar medium for her. She had she had recorded cassette tapes for her family back in Iran when we were in those early years in America. So she starts to tell the story of her life on these cassette tapes. She sends me one or two a month. Um, They trickle in by post and I didn't even have a tape record. I didn't have a machine to play them on. (laughs) You know, this is the nineties, but, um, but, but I, I start to listen to these and tape by tape, it reveals the story of her marriage at 13. So she was married when she was 13 the first time. And she had a child that she had to give up when she divorced her first husband or was allowed to divorce her husband. And so the tapes tell this this hidden story, a story that she'd really not told anybody. She hadn't even told her closest friends of you know 30 and 40 years this story about her marriage as a child or as a young woman. Can I just uh, stop there and say, uh, you didn't ask for these tapes, right? I mean, they just start arriving. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, they did start arriving. That, it's it's really extraordinary. I mean, it's mm-hmm. really extraordinary, especially in the context of of Persian families and and secrets and you know taboos and what what do you think? Or I mean, I guess you must know. You've probably talked to her about it. But what yeah. what was the precipitant for your mom to think? you know what, I'm going to actually record my life and start sending it to my daughter. I think part of her always had wanted to tell me and she just didn't find the moment or we hadn't reached that point in our relationship. And this is, this is, I think many people have this where you really have to hit a point in your own adulthood where you can encounter your parent as a person. I just had not reached that. She probably saw that in me, right. you know, and um, and then this, I'd make this discovery and maybe it hastens that process that she might have eventually gotten around to. But then I think also I had started writing and she saw me angling toward her life <laughs> with my pen in a sense. She saw me coming toward our family story and I believe that she saw she could control the story to some effect so if she produced these tapes if she opened up to me she could tell a version of the story that I was that I might not tell had I waited let's say until she passed away a lot of people wait until their parents pass away she was um, I think she in, in typical fashion for her she wanted 
she wanted to participate in the telling of the story. She did not want me running loose with her life story. Although there's a big difference between telling you the story or even telling the extended family the story or even telling the community the story mm-hmm. and a book that comes out on a major, you know, that bestseller book. I mean, <laughs> how did writing a memoir about your mom and you square with the Persian family culturally mandated desire for privacy and certainly <laughs> keeping our dirty laundry buried? I mean, really, that's a, this is, this would be a huge step, I would think, for, uh, you know, uh, I mean, when I wrote a book, my, my memoir, my parents were like, okay, as long as you leave us out of it, <laughs> you know, which was impossible, <laughs> of course, but they were just like, yeah. please don't write about us. Uh, how, I mean, how do you, how, how did that happen? Yeah, I have a friend who says you should write a book about what it was like writing this book because there was so much drama and I probably repressed it by now, the worst episodes. But there were several times where she just threatened to pull the plug on the whole project. And I have a very vivid memory of her at one point. You know what galleys are. It's like the last stage just before the book's going to be published. There are these advanced copies that come out that go out to the press and and media and I had a galley copy that I handed to her and she showed up one day at the house and she just tore it page by page. She said, you know, I'm not going to let you do this. (laughs) And, and I had to, you know, see us that, you know, like this, this negotiation, it was a kind of the supreme test of uh, my negotiation skills with her because I had to appeal to her pride. So that was, I think really what, what, kept her at it was you know her pride in having her to- her story told and published you know but um but you know i really had to massage that and and assure her that let's say something she really objected to was in in the book i write about how my grandfather had physically abused my mm-hmm. grandmother and mm-hmm. she was livid she could not believe that i i kept that in the book and i said to her you have we have to keep it in there because if people don't know that about him, they can't know how noble he was in allowing you to get an education and a divorce, you know, all of those things he did for you. People need to see how far he came. So that's just an example of the kind of the the diplomacy I had to, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. In By the way, just as a, as a sidebar, right? people who are, might be interested in this book, if they, if they haven't read it already, it's not just a, a, a remarkable story of your mom, Lily, but um, but it, it kind of plays as an interesting history of Iran in the 20th century, too, told from a, uh, a woman's perspective. Uh, for example, when Reza Shah imposes the, the, the ban on veils in, in 1936, and, and your family, um, meaning your mom's mom, etc., had been quite religious and took umbrage at that and, and never ended up going out because they didn't want to take their veils off. I mean, these kind of moments of Iranian history are fascinating, and it's fascinating to hear them through this story. Yeah, yeah. and that was an important part of the book for me was, was situating our family story within that history. I think that's, to me, really one of the gifts of memoir is that you can you can see this really interesting interplay between the intimate and the, the wider um, society. And, and I had not, at that point, I hadn't really encountered a story like my mother's played up against this really contradictory, paradoxical history of Iran in the 20th century. I guess it's it's always an obvious question, so forgive me for it, but how much of writing that book was not just wanting to tell your mom's story, but try to figure out your own path, you know, if, if learning about your own roots and how you've become who you are? It was a lot of it. I, I had entered graduate school. I wanted at first to write um, a dissertation about the Victorian novel, and I wound up doing my um, my dissertation on Iranian women's writing. So that, that, was, that itself, I think, was really, it, it suggests how I had, it, it had become very important to me to know that history, to learn it. And um, and so it was absolutely an opportunity to to look at that history, to look at the culture again, and to find myself in it. Um, you know, from about a minute or half a minute, I thought about publishing it as a novel. Mm-hmm. But I decided against that because I felt like a story like my mother's, you know, sometimes truths are much stranger than fiction. And the story that my mother had to tell was 
it was so rich and and so complicated. I I felt like if I wrote it as a fiction, it could easily be dismissed. You know, oh, right. that, she just made that up, right? Oh, she's exaggerating. I that's the voice of the community, I guess, in my head. Yes. <laughs> you know, oh. did you change names to protect people or anything like that, or or is it is it pretty much the actual? I did history? change name. I did change. I didn't change my obviously my own name, but I changed my mother and my father's name, and not because I needed to protect their identity. Identity, but because when you're writing, even it's a, even if it's a memoir, you need to establish a distance between yourself and uh-huh. the facts. And so, giving my mom a pseudonym opened up a space. I could I could think of her as a character, as a novelist would. And paradoxically, I could get closer to the truth by playing this trick on myself. By the way, something that you realize that when you publish that memoir. Um, I think I saw this in an interview that you did, or you wrote this somewhere, but that um, that you find out that the good daughter experience uh, is not a unique one. You find out from some Iranian women who end up reading this book that the story of a woman who is married young, divorced young, uh, uh, suffers all kinds of uh, indignity, has to give up a child in 20th century Iran was, was something that um, resonated for a lot of people out there. Definitely. I had many Iranian women sort of pull me aside and in whispers tell me, this happened to my aunt, this happened to my sister, this happened even, someone said, this happened to me. And there there were for sure many people who stepped up. And then interesting also that American readers sometimes had a similar experience in their family. So it wasn't only Iranians who could recognize um, themselves in it, but also some Americans, which was really interesting. Did that surprise you or did you take solace in that? You know, it, it didn't so much because honestly, at the time this is happening to my mother in Iran, America had a really similar kind of gender <laughs> you know, situation going on. So some of the most relevant research I found was women who in the 50s in America were sent to these homes for unwed mothers, you know, that there were these stories happening in America simultaneously, where a young woman would become pregnant, and her family would basically sequester her, they would take the child away. And there would be this total silence then for generations, um, that the woman, the, the woman who'd been pregnant and given up the child wouldn't speak of it. And sometimes would speak of it late in life where it would be discovered. So so that was very interesting. And I think for me, <laughs> you know, it in a way satisfying because sometimes when you write about Iran, there's the the response from readers, oh, what a terrible place, you know. Right. Oh, you know, that never happens here. And it did happen here. It does happen here. This is not anything unique right. um, necessarily to Iran. Your second book, um, which came out in 2018, um, was also a big hit. I mean, you're, you're three for three at this point. For your, your three books, you, you've done so well. But for your second book, you decide to write about Farouk Farzad. And uh, this is a name, this is the trailblazing um, young female poet, um, filmmaker, uh, um, it from known from 1950s, 1960s Iran, who of course died tragically young, um, but set such a standard. Her name has come up a few times, Jasmine, recently. Recently on this show, uh, Susan Dehim and Farzad Milani and people who took such inspiration and such interest in her life. Why, for you, was Farouk Farzad someone that you wanted to focus a second book on? I think for a lot of us, Farouk is just larger than life. You know, when we came in 1979, my mother brought a book of Furul's poems. And I have heard from many other Iranians that they fled in a hurry, but they brought Furul's book, you know, it was a book that they had loved and wanted to take with them when they left the country. And, and yet there'd also been a lot of mystery around her, especially around her death, there's a whole mythology around Furul's life. So I think I wasn't done with Iran or Iran wasn't done with me when I finished The Good Daughter. And it felt that by looking at Fudel's life again, I could go deeper into that history, into the culture and look at it from a different vantage point, go into Iranian women's lives through Fudel. If you can put your professor hat on for a second, historical fiction is a challenge. You, You have to tell a story that history in a sense could not tell. How do you go about doing that? 
This is really tricky because, you know, to Iranians, of course, Hurur is iconic. And I knew many people would know at least the basic facts of her life. And so I came up with a rule for myself. And it's still the rule that I hold <laughs> for myself is that anything I made up had to feel consonant with the truth. So any scenes I invented had to feel like you could trace them back to her poems, for example, or you could find some kind of touchstone in her letters that, that could lead you back there. I didn't want someone who knew Fudel's poetry, as so many P Iranians do know her poems and love them, to not recognize her. So it you have to begin with the life, and I think you have to be respectful of what is there within that thankfully there's still a lot of space for the imagination and i've i have another rule for myself is i really do feel that if you're writing a novel you have to you have to tell something that a biography or history can't so you do have to deploy your imagination um you have to do that thing el doctorow uh, an american writer said history can tell you what happened but fiction tells you what it was like what it felt like for that to happen so we know we know the contours of Fudel's life, but what did it feel like for her to live that life? What did it feel like to live those moments that become the great poems we know? That's where I wanted to go with fiction. And if with your first book, your memoir, you thought about writing that as a novel, you could have written about Fudel Farzad as nonfiction. Uh, it's interesting that why, why did you make the decision to turn it into a novel? <laughs> You know, probably I was, I was in part, I'd, I'd suffered terribly <laughs> with the writing of that <laughs> memoir. And I, and I, and I thought, I'm just, I'm done with memoir for now. I'm done with being beholden to, to the facts and, you know, to those who have a certain, you know, expectation of what I'm doing. Maybe it was part of that. But, but also, I mean, to be honest, how many Americans are going to read a nonfiction account of Fudel. There's some, absolutely, there are some, and the, the professor in me wants to believe there are many. Right. But by telling her, her story as a novel, I felt like I could potentially reach more readers. And, and that could then make them curious about her poetry and make them curious about her biography. But I know from, from my own experiences, tell me a story and I'm in. So right, right, right. that's what I wanted to do. Well, let me ask you about Fudel and and... Iranian female writers, Farzana Milani, who was on this program not too long ago, talks about women and specifically Iranian women writers being at what she says the forefront of um, modernizing and moderating contemporary Iran. She, it's the women writers who are basically leading uh, the progressive <laughs> movement, if there is one. Can, can you reflect on that? I, I know Professor Milani's work so well, and I, I respect it so much. She's been such a, um, her works are so illuminating on this topic. I, I think that's absolutely true that the renegades were the women in, in writing, maybe because they had a lesser stake. You know, they were never really insiders in the way men could be. Um, when you look at Iranian literature, there, was, <laughs> there wasn't an established place for them. And so maybe they could take more risks. Um, Furuk for sure did, but they also paid a price for it. So Professor Milani also has written about the costs of these rebellions yes. for women. So many of our great Iranian women writers are actually driven insane, are presumed to be insane. And as Furuk was put in a mental asylum, for example, commit suicide, die under mysterious circumstances. Yeah. It's a pretty yeah. bleak chronicle. Yeah. So the work is revolutionary, but the revolutionaries often suffered terrible fates. Okay, it's a perfect segue, because speaking of Iranian writers, I want to get to the Bohemians. This is your <laughs> your new book. Uh, I mentioned, by the way, critically acclaimed. I couldn't find somebody saying a bad thing about this. It's, it's only come out this month, but congratulations. This is set in America in the 1920s. Yeah. Jasmine, you said, I mean, a moment ago you said, uh, Iran wasn't done with me, I wasn't done with Iran. This book is about the States, about a, an American subject. You, you said you were frustrated to be seen as an Iranian writer. And that was part of your incentive to get out of a focus on Iran and, and write the Bohemians. What is the challenge with being seen as, a, as an Iranian writer? Does that come with stereotypes or expectations? There has been, I have felt like my value as a writer in those first two books was really tied to being Iranian and telling an exotic story, you know, or what's presumed to be an exotic story. And I knew 
I just I knew that there were people who would not read me outright because unfortunately Iran is still demonized and there are so many stereotypes around Iran and it wouldn't stop me from writing again about Iran but I was really really kind of you know frustrated and I felt like well I'll tell you an American story and I'll show you that I can do it <laughs> you, you know and um, and at this point to be honest I'm as American as I am Iranian I'm not just the one I'm both and so it was it didn't feel like a false move it didn't feel like I was pretending to be something or care about something I didn't but the story I tell about America in Bohemians is a story that has a lot to do with immigrants and race and a lot of that is refracted um, through my own experience as an immigrant, Iranian immigrant yes. in America. Yes, it, it does deal with a lot of immigrant issues. I, I have to say, your writing is so good. I, I feel I had the feeling of disappearing into this world that you created with the uh, transporting us into 1920s San Francisco. Um, and it's an interesting paradox because it seems you know, it's the Roaring Twenties, and and San Francisco is the epicenter of art and culture and interesting people, and it seems like a a wild and fun time, and yet there are these deep and difficult and and horrible societal issues going on. Mm -hmm. What captured your imagination about this period in the history of your city, and making Dorothea Lang the subject to tell it? <sighs> I really have always been enraptured by the twenties. I've had, you know, this crush on the twenties <laughs> since since I was a teenager and reading about the left bank of Paris. Um, I knew I wanted to write an American story. I knew I wanted to write a San Francisco story, and so I fell in love with this building, which is where the Transamerica building is now. In the book, it's almost like a character. Right. And I started scouting, really, honestly, like a director. I was looking for somebody who had lived there or been a part of that world. And Dorothea Lange, um, most people know her if they do from this one photograph she took called My Grant Mother. But she came in 1918. In a way, she was an immigrant. Um, she, she was the child of immigrants, but she came from New Jersey. Her first day in San Francisco, she's robbed. She has no money. And somehow this woman, within a year, she and her Chinese American assistant are running the most renowned photo studio in San Francisco. How does that happen? There's a story there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it was really, you know, thinking about, um, thinking about women, thinking about um, this time in history where there's a lot of possibility, but like you say, also, there's a lot of, there are a lot of dark and troubling aspects to American history at that moment. We've come out of World War One. Tell me if this sounds familiar. There's, a, there's this rising sense of nationalism, yes. um, xenophobia. So everything's sparkling on the surface, but underneath, and if you look at the artist's work, you can't not see there, there were troubles under this glittering surface. There was a lot else going on. You're, you're obviously very good at writing about or helping us understand strong women. Dorothea Lang is a strong woman, but but so is you just mentioned the Chinese American assistant Caroline Carolina. She she is probably my favorite character in the book, and she's she is so full of strength and yet dealing with anti-immigrant, anti-Chinese issues at that time in San Francisco in the 1920s in America. Um, can you tell us a bit about her? Sure. I, and I, I also, I love her and I miss her. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really glad that you enjoyed her character. In accounts of Dorothea Lange, there's this reference really brief in her biographies that she had a Chinese American assistant. Most of the time she's not named. Sometimes she's called the mission girl. And I think as an immigrant myself, I thought there was more to that story. There was more to this woman. woman I just knew it. And so um, in the novel, I imagine a story for her, one that history has not afforded her. You know, I imagine her as much um, a part of Dorothea's story as Dorothea was in hers. <laughs> right. uh, and and uh, and I and I imagine a genuine friendship about between them. So Caroline is uh, she's Chinese American. She is incredibly gutsy. She takes Dorothea by hand, Dory by hand, and gives her entree into this bohemian community. But as they become friends, Dor Dory starts to see San Francisco and America through Caroline's experience. So Caroline cannot walk in the streets without the fear of being honestly 
violently assaulted most yeah. most of the time yeah and yet she you know she's also really creative and and has a lot of verve and and style to her so um she's just a great pleasure to write especially because she didn't exist in the history books it's it's weird because you're writing about the 1920s in america you're writing about 100 years ago and yet as you just intimated a moment ago when you said that does this sound familiar there are eerie parallels to America of today, the anti-immigrant sentiment, class disparity, a global pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> did you did you realize <laughs> that this book would have such a resonance with America of today? I really didn't, and it's and it's really you know it's gratifying in some ways to hear this. Um, but also, of course, I don't have prophetic powers. I did not know that we were heading into a pandemic when I started this book. I knew that the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic was going to figure in it. But living through a pandemic, of course, made me, (laughs) you know, it it, it really, it put a different emphasis on it in the book. Um, And I think it's, you know, honestly, it's not so much that history repeats itself, is that none of this is history. It's been continuously happening for the past hundred years. If you're an immigrant and you read this story, you know this story as well as you know your own life, um, the precariousness of your existence in America, the ways that at any moment it can all be ripped away from you. We know this story. It's never yeah, yeah. not been happening to us. And so, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that people see the parallels, but I think it's also, it's deeper than that. It's that this is our story, not history. Well, how do there is a senator in the book? I think that that says keep California white. I mean, reading about this, this you know, there's so many lessons that <laughs> you know that you sort of go, okay, well, you know, maybe we haven't learned anything. Uh, no. it, the subtext of all of your books seems to be somehow reconciling or understanding our past. How do you believe we should look back at our lives and and um, try and grapple with our social cultural history to move forward? That is a massive question. Sorry, yeah, it is. As I was saying, it, I was like, what am I yeah. asking this person? To? <laughs> she needs an encyclopedia to answer this. But you can do it. You're the professor, lawyer, doctor. Come on. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I feel in some ways. Sometimes I feel as a storyteller, my powers are so small. You know, I I don't feel that I can affect this conversation all that much but it but then i think about how in my family it really is astonishing that in one generation you could move from my mother who's married at 13 and has to keep this truth about herself hidden for 50 years to a writer who can explore and explode all this in writing you know and so i think for me one thing is i think that it's secrets fester and not looking exacerbates these issues and then secondarily, I do find hope and solace and inspiration in the fact that the storytellers are changing and that necessarily changes the story, right? So writing my books, I think what I try to do is to show you um, the stories that have been forgotten or lost or were never told in the first place. And there's a power in that. I think the more of us that can tell these stories, there's I do believe, I have to believe that there's a power in that, that there's some remediation that comes from the, the new storytellers on the scene. Jasmine, I can't help thinking about, um, as you're talking, thinking about the characters, uh, the characters who are <laughs> real people uh, from The Good Daughter, uh, the, your family back in Iran, the women back in Iran. Your, uh, do they... Do they Have they read your books? Do you, do you hear from them? Do they... What do they say? <laughs> You know, it's so funny, but we, we spend so much time worrying about what our family is going to think about the memoirs. And honestly, most of my family has not read the book. I don't think they have, or they've read maybe they've read some of my writing, and it's not been for them. And they've just sort of, in polite Iranian fashion, chosen never to speak of it again. So, you know, to the extent I ever worried about that, I don't anymore. I really have not heard from many of my relatives, my cousins who are younger, and you know, we grew up alongside each other they're very sweet and very supportive of my career but you know it's it's nothing that really anymore I feel I don't feel in any way bound to their opinions anymore because they really have not shown me (laughs) that they particularly care Hmm. about what I'm doing honestly I mean all this we started talking about shame is we spend so much energy thinking about what people say is about us as Iranians and you know in the end 
people don't care that much. They're so busy with their own stuff. It's a bit sad, that answer. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, it's a bit sad. I, I, I would want to hear that your family in Iran does read it all and really understand you know appreciates what you know in a way that you're creating this written history you know yeah the, you know in my books of now it's taken a while so, for a long time i thought i had no iranian readers I, i'd meet one or two at readings and they were lovely and so gracious and told me you know how, how much they enjoyed the books um, but I really didn't imagine I had Iranian readers. Then my first, my second book got translated without my knowledge um, into Persian and did really well. And then they recently, with again without my knowledge. Sorry, you mean somebody just to re- translated it and put it out, and they, they don't? Yeah. Tell you? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They tell you when it's done. <laughs> right. When it's a done deal. Right. Yeah. So I found out the eve, you know, of publication that I was about to be published in Iran. <laughs> and the same thing happened with The Good Daughter. And then, you know, so while my own family has not responded, really, um, I have gotten notes from Iranian readers. And so maybe this will make you feel a little bit better about it, is that, that the notes I've gotten from Iranian women, especially in Iran, have shown me that there is a, a sense of appreciation and, and gratitude and um, well-wishing, you know, mm-hmm. that they are, they do, they do enjoy these books and find that I've told a story well about us. Mm-hmm. By the way, you don't have to make me feel better. I, I'm, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's you I'm thinking of as well. You know, I mean, it's, it's, these are your, the, your, your works. I, I mean, uh, listen, it, it is such a, a pleasure talking to you. It's everything that I would hope it to be. Your, uh, that I could talk to you forever and ask you questions about the world. One of the things that I guess we deal with that we've that has maybe formed the subtext of this interview as as immigrants and that you touch on is uh, throughout your work um, is imposter syndrome. Is the struggle for assimilation is somehow feeling like we're not worthy. Uh, mm. And even if you go to Princeton like you did, even if you become a successful <laughs> auth- author and a professor and a lawyer, uh, what have you learned about how to defy, deny uh, imposter syndrome? Mm. I try more and I succeed more in getting my getting out of my own way. So I'm never going to be free of some of this, but the work is more important than I am. That's my attitude toward it now is to the extent that I can get out of my own way and I can write the stories. um, That's success for me at this point. Um, And, you know, it's, it's, it's never, I I really don't think it's ever going to go away, but it is in a sense. um, I always want to do better. I always want to write a better book tell a truer story, be more myself. And that's not, that's not a bad place to live and to be, you know, I I would not want to be somebody who felt entirely settled. As a person, I think that would be terrible to get to a point where I thought I knew it all. But um, as a writer, it helps me, it really does to feel like there's more to do, um, that there's, there's a deeper truth to tell. And and so I'm going to keep doing that. Well, let me let me put it to you another way. If one of your students at the California College of the Arts comes up to you and says, and maybe it's a talented student, maybe it's a yeah. a, a young woman that you th- you see a lot of uh, future in it, and mm-hmm. says, I, I don't I don't really know if I can call myself a writer. Am I a writer? I don't know if I'm good enough to be called a writer. What mm. would you say? I would say find some people who are your people. So. I think for me, and I haven't talked a lot, I haven't talked about this in this, um, in our conversation, but the moment when I signed up for a writing workshop, and it was not in the hallowed halls of Princeton, it was actually in our bookshop down the street. Book I took passage, first, book passage, yeah, shout book out. Passage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I took my first writing workshop at book passage, uh, just a, you know, just a community workshop. Um, and that changed my life. That was a moment where I was not an expert. And I also just was playing, you know, for the first time, probably in my life, I was just writing for the pure pleasure of it. And also, because I loved the company, I loved these other women who were in that 
writing workshop. So finding your people, finding people in Bohemians, Dorothea finds Caroline, she finds these other women photographers, and it changes how she sees herself. So that is huge. That's a big, big, um, <laughs> big step. And I and I would recommend if a young woman came to me, I would say, find at least one person who is doing the work you want to do and do it alongside each other. That's going to transform the two of you. How's it going with your mom these days? <laughs> I could write a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> Another one. <laughs> yeah, no, don't even get me started. But she, you know, <laughs> she, um, she, we, she lives with me, and I have a, you know, a very, very complicated relationship with her. Still, she has Alzheimer's, so <sighs> she no longer, um, you know, she really is no longer the person I once knew. But we have a tender love between us now that's that's pretty astonishing you know after all the things we've been through and all of the anger I had uh, we're in a really different place right now and I'm glad I had this time with her too you know maybe I'll write about it I probably won't but mm. um, but but that's that's part of the, the story behind my stories is mm. that she's still very much part of my life is it I'm sorry I didn't know is, is it advanced Jasmine can she can you read her yeah. the bohemians or no, I can't. Uh, she does. She has maybe a glimmering understanding that I wrote the book, you know, but you know, it's very sweet when I do my zoom events. Now I'm on book tour. She always wants to watch. So I'm oh. upstairs in the office. <laughs> and, um, and my husband will sit her down and, and she doesn't understand what I'm saying. But that pride is still there. You know, that that Iranian tiger mom pride where oh jasmine is on television <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that's sweet it's very sweet and she has no for the first time she has no criticism of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just everything i do is wonderful now uh congratulations on your latest book and uh on all the success you've had i thank you so much for the time you've given us and for the insights and i look forward to doing it again sometime I would love that. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful conversation. Bye-bye. Bye. Jasmine Darznick. She's a professor in the MFA in Writing and Literature programs at the California College of the Arts. Her latest book is the critically acclaimed book called The Bohemians. Jasmine Darznick joined me from the San Francisco Bay Area today. Microphone's back on for Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, and the fabulous Keon. Uh, we'll file that person, uh, Jasmine Darznick, under, you know, add, add her to the list of people I could just talk to for hours. It was a pleasure to listen to that whole interview. My God, I, um, <laughs> I'm speechless. I don't know what to say. I, you know, the... I don't. I wasn't aware that there were memoirs like this out there, like the, her book about um, her mother's life. And I think it's through. Now you really want to read it, right? Vaughan, yeah. Seriously, and it's it's you know we know we're aware of our culture, of our own family situations. Mm -hmm. And here I am thinking I thought it was just my family, for example, that has all these issues and things. But we all do. So the more we talk about it, the more we educate mm -hmm. each other on what's really happening, the better it's going to be for our culture in the long run. So. That's what I think. Nice, Keon. I, I think you said that without the guest thinking that you hate them. So, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> I never hate any guest. Except <laughs> Kambi <laughs> Sosei. <laughs> no. Uh, who now loves you. Yeah. Uh, yeah we, also, I mean, I sort of joked with her about it, but uh, I'm still thinking about it. Like, just listening to Jack, it, it, it's whether it's feeling like we're not good enough or imposter mm. syndrome yeah. it's amazing i mean i definitely uh, there's a lot of things that as you could probably tell i was doing either, that i identify with her yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know there's uh, but one of them being this notion of nothing ever being good enough she's right. this she's a lawyer professor phd yeah, yeah. best-selling author and she's like yeah. i'm working on it i'm working on yeah. feeling like i'm good enough and I, I know that's not unique to Iranians, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, people, everyone from uh, 
Tina Fey to Jerry Seinfeld have talked about right. imposter syndrome. You know, the feeling of inadequacy, like somebody's going to find out that we're not as good as we think we as as we're supposed to be. But but it's still, I feel something that in our Iranian culture is endemic is so embedded in that notion especially for those of us mm-hmm. who come west of you know i mean i joke about it with my dear old father but you know he, the thing he used to you know, please work harder Absolutely. it was like they're the, the he's like nothing is good enough yeah, you, yeah. you got an a it should be an a plus yeah. and she's she's Addressing proof that. of that yeah. yeah the other thing i uh, th- that was flashing in my head as i was listening to this in our culture it's we have this issue where we always have to save face for the public mm. like um i don't know about you but i know of a lot of marriages for example where it's just not working they're both miserable um and they're staying together just because mm. they're s- afraid of what people will think and when, and here i am screaming who the mm. Who, who effing cares yeah. what people yeah. think? Live your life. You have to be happy. What are you doing? Yeah. Anyway. Well, the appearances thing yeah. is huge in our... Right. I mean, this is a... Jasmine's a big example yeah. of her mom not wanting people to know right. what job she was doing. Right. But I mean, I know people... I, I, I know someone in town who... Uh, I don't even want to say what she does because people might recognize her. Right. She's She's got a, a, a kind of a public job. Mm-hmm. Uh, she has no money... But she's Iranian, so she drives a Mercedes Benz SUV. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's like, why do you have that car? And it's because you know you got to look a certain yeah. way, right? What's the and word like, for that, Shaya? Um, no, Abru, no. yeah, Abru. That's it. I, I don't know. I don't. The other cultures must have this too, but I, for some reason, I feel like it's highlighted in the Persian culture. Abru, yeah. yeah okay. um, Shahjan, your thoughts on uh, Jasmine Darznik? I, you, you seemed very happy as we were doing that interview. Oh right? yes, yes. I love the interview. Uh, I. I think she's a, uh, she's a great example of what Dr. Farzan Emilani said about how women writer can change the game, and she is a you know she's a great example of that thing. And also, it's interesting for for me the impact of Furuk Farrokhzad. Yeah. it's the you know we're not trying to no, book no. people who keep Ex- mentioning Furuk exactly, Farrokhzad. Yeah, yeah. It's coming up uh, yeah. frequently and it's interesting yeah. yeah fascinating for me it was when she was talking about finding um, um, that picture of her mom I, 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 sh- I was on the edge of my seat it was like it's like watching a movie unfold it was crazy there should be a movie made about her life mm-hmm. they're probably I wonder if they've optioned that book I mean it, it, that's the first book so one. it's from 10 years ago um, but the, the crazy part as I said in the interview the remarkable part to me is her mom first of all dismisses her you know i'm not going to tell you what that don't ask don't mm-hmm. and then start sending these cassette tapes wow, yeah. recording her story because she amazing. felt shame she could she probably yeah. couldn't uh, you know talk about this stuff face to face but it's easier to kind of maybe send it to her that way i've been waiting for you to send me cassette tapes <laughs> Kian, One let me know how it's going with the doctor you know oh to really God. to really explain yeah, talking about issues <laughs> in the persian community <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jian. If you're listening to this, then you know this is Kion. Recently, the doctor said he didn't like my hair. Uh, no, no. I want you to know on this cassette tape that you have nothing to play you on. You guys spoke about <laughs> that, right? How in the Persian community, you, you either have to become a doctor or marry a doctor. And here I am analyzing my own life. I've that's li- right, dated that's a right. list of doctors. You either, gotta, you got, like, you, you either have to become a doctor or marry a doctor or yeah. preferably both. But I think the for idea? me, it's yeah. like, um, uh, what's that word when making sure species like uh, go forward? Procreate? Pro- um, but there's a like uh, natural selection. Uh-huh. I think the universe put me with a doctor because I'm I'm so accident prone. Uh, really, I mean oh. this. I, I'm capable yeah, you, of hurting myself. You need myself. to be with someone. You I need immediate medical attention. Exactly. Yeah. All the attention. I need someone to observe my life and make sure I don't hurt myself. All right. <laughs> anyway, but yes, other good stuff uh, <laughs> along with that too. Yeah, your tape will include Hygian. To save my Aberu, I'm going to stay with a doctor. <laughs> yeah. And nah, also, bah, it helps. Nah, 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 nah. But it's it, more than that for me. It must have it's British accent, I think, in your what? tape. That's right. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. It has to be. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I could go on and on yeah. about that. Anyway, <laughs> we're not in We have to me. all send each other yeah. tape. Mm, hi, this is Reza. <laughs> Hello, Jiang. <laughs> but it's fascinating. Um, I grew up my beard. <laughs> getting into the psyche of people and why they do certain things. Like, it, uh. it goes back to how you grew up and your influences and oh my god Gian you're the expert of 
div- like basically bringing everything to light. So yes, you're doing a good job. I oh, think. thank yes. you. Yes, yeah. You thank said you. something like that last week too about how Rook has uh, impacted you, and I and I Honestly. I f- I felt bad because on the show I was like, ha, yeah, yeah, but actually I really appreciate that, and 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 you know, it, it's true for me too that. Uh, I mean, if I were to say what the, what the best thing about Rook mm-hmm. is, it, I'm thrilled that it's growing and the yeah. success we're having, you know, and it's becoming this global thing. But honestly, the opportunity to learn, yeah. to be for the sake of the show, mm-hmm. you know, to read these books and to, to, to learn about both Rostak and Rastok, both of them, <laughs> exactly. uh, both pronunciations. Yeah. You know, that those are just things that I, I may not have done or probably I wouldn't no, have done. No, we wouldn't yeah, have. Yeah, no. so it's, it's and... The best thing is when people write and say, uh, I've been in the Iranian community my whole life and now I'm learning all these things exactly. about our culture. Isn't that's, that crazy? Yeah. yeah. And that's Shia <sighs> writing to me. <laughs> 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 all right. All right. So it is Monday. It is uh, the end of the show, before the end of the show on Mondays. As ever, Letters of the Week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what do we what do we got, Kia? And I know that we were going to talk well, about Batman Robadi, huh? My my God, let me just begin by saying thank you to everybody that wrote to us because it's it was such a pleasure to read some of these letters that I'm about to read to all of you. Um, and just a note, uh, so we edit letters for length sometimes, but never to change the actual message. That's not the intention. So like like I mentioned, last week on episode 105, we had the acclaimed Iranian Kurdish director Bahman Gobadi on the show. Yes. And we just had a ton of letters flowing, beautiful letters. A re- you know, I think a part of it uh, is that it's a rare interview. He yeah. does He rarely does interviews. Mm-hmm. Right. He hasn't done a lot of them. And so this it, was... It was a- getting to know him. I, I, I don't think there's a lot of interviews out there that really dives into his soul. So that, you know, there's that... So anyway, on YouTube, we have a Farzane Sadarian Lu. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, wrote, Bahman Robadi is a great filmmaker. His life by itself is very interesting and heart touching, which can be a good idea to make a movie out of it. Kurdish people are lovely and important. Artists and movie makers can do a lot by using their power in order to unite human beings all over the world through messages of love. Thank you, Jian, and your team for this interesting interview. Thanks, Farzani. And then we have a beautiful letter from username Pasumash. So he or she wrote, I really enjoyed your interview with Bahman Robadi. I couldn't help but think that Mr. Robadi's borderless lifestyle and difficulties for expression through art beautifully mirrors or encapsulates a Kurdish narrative. He is everywhere and nowhere, renowned yet invisible. The Kurds have suffered for expression in the same light, and to some degree, so has the Iranian culture. The need to express is most human, and when one cannot express his or herself to another human being, we find solace in nature. So in a way, Mr. Robadi is not in exile. He is in touch with nature and has realized that borders do not define us. Intentionally or not, Mr. Robadi is living a Persian nomadic lifestyle, and I applaud him for that. After all, to be connected with nature and to celebrate nature is quintessentially Iranian. Wow. Wow, that is a great letter. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's uh, that strikes to the heart of, I, I, I don't know, I felt like I said it on the episode or maybe uh, I said it to him, but I, I certainly feel like he, Batman Kobadi in that interview was a metaphor for the Kurdish people. Yeah. He's sort of saying, I don't mm-hmm. have or need a material home. I want to support my people, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I am, uh, I, I am identifying with my people. Yeah. You know, uh, it's a great letter. Thank God. you, Pars, Parsumash. It's uh, made me a little emotional, to be honest. Um, okay, and then we have Turash Khosravi wrote, "Rook, the recent episodes are so fantastic, very inspiring, and such fascinating guests to listen to." I enjoy your program from the first minute you guys have your silly, hilarious chit-chat. All silly? <laughs> wow. Pretty serious, actually. All the way to the profound interviews and such unique stories that must be heard. I wish the very best for every single one of you guys and keep growing bigger and better. 
Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. Every single one. Every single even, one of even these. Even Rohan. <laughs> <laughs> is including everybody. Yeah. And then we have a Daniel Mirsky wrote, Mr. Kobadi is a living legend. Thank you for sharing him with us. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. And then we have a letter from Krista Kaufman. She wrote, excellent interview with Bahman Kobadi. Will there be an interview with Ramin Bahrani? Mm. Only issue was that the subtitles were exactly where the ad banner comes across the screen several times. Lol, otherwise, excellent job, Captain Reza. <laughs> Need to put it higher up on screen in the future. Wow. <laughs> Krista Kaufman not only finding a problem, but knowing who <laughs> created the problem. <laughs> Captain Reza. Captain Reza, your, your response to this letter, this outrage. Keen, keen observer. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I take it into account next time. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> All right. And then moving on, uh, on Instagram, we have someone by the name of Negar, last name SM, wrote us. Such a great interview. I was hooked as he was telling stories and taking us to the li- deeper layers of his character and personality. So rare and unique. However, I think if he had not become a director or movie maker, he wouldn't be a drug dealer or a bad person as he mentioned in the interview, but a poet or a philosopher instead. The figurative language that he was using with different metaphors and similes made me think about my surroundings in a different way. Thank you, Rook Team, for another great episode. These are great letters. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Blown away. And then we have a Sadaf Dargohi wrote, I think I found my new favorite episode. This man is a volcano of emotions and how beautifully he described himself in the last 10 minutes of the interview, which made me cry. Thank you, Rook, and thank you, Jian, as always, for asking deep questions to bring all these beautiful topics out of this legend. I can listen to this over and over. Uh, that's that's. Thank you for that. Sadaf. Yes, Sadaf. And then we have Atifa Tabish wrote, "What a mind-blowing interview! This was the best life lecture I ever had." Bahman Robadi is a legend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, I almost feel like we should quit. <laughs> I'm not going to beat this <laughs> interview. Ahead, yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then we have a general letter that came in from a uh, Andrew Schmatnik. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He or she wrote, and here I am, Canadian, Israeli or Russian origin, listening to episode after episode of this wonderful podcast about Iranian culture and heritage. Glad I found it. Thank you so much for doing it in English. Nice. Yes. I love that. Yes. Thank you. Is that the letter of the day? <laughs> That's I, great. I saved it for second last. Oh, no, that means yeah. a lot. That's like yeah. the best thing yeah. to hear. Really Somebody, yeah. uh, an Israeli Canadian or a Russian Canadian, something mm-hmm. like both, uh, yeah. uh, finding this interesting, being able to dip into Iranian culture because we're doing it in English. That was our whole idea, exactly. you know, for doing it in English. That's that's yeah. so great. Thank you for that. Love it. Um, speaking of which, it's time for the letter of the week. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I I know what you guys are thinking. How could I possibly top all of those letters? We'll get this. Somebody emailed us by the name of Mohamed Nimat. He wrote to us saying, Dear Kak Jian and Rook staff, and Kak means uh, brother in Kurdish. So he's saying uh, brother Jian. Thanks, Kak Mohamed. And I think it's Mohamed Nimat. Nimat, I'm sorry. Mohamed Nimat. E A. E A? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And I don't know, actually, I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> anyway, we on, he says, my name is Mohammad, and I'm from Iraqi Kurdistan, Dohak City. I just found your channel and listened to the greatest Kurdish director, Bahman Robadi's interview. As a big fan of Mr. Robadi, I watched and listened to all his movies and interviews that I found on the internet. I always wanted to see him face to face and talk to him about a lot of things, cinema, life, humans. In this interview, I felt Bahman was sitting in front of me and talking to me personally. I just want to thank you for this awesome interview and the great staff that you have there. Thanks again. And I say in Kurdish, Harbijit, meaning live long or thank you. (laughs) Uh, And then he says, best regards, Mohammed Nimat. Wow. That's that's great. Yeah. All the way from Iraqi Kurdistan. Harbijit. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. Um, thanks, Mohammed. Thanks. <laughs> to you. I'm thrilled that you're listening in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan and hope you keep doing so. And thank you to all of those folks who wrote in. Thank you, Keon, for curating and selecting these letters. Uh, thank you, Captain Breza. Thank you, Groovy Shia. Great job, everybody. This is full time for Rook for today. 
Thursday on the show, Merdad Isvandi and Persian Yoga. Make sure to tune in for that. In the meantime, catch up on all of our episodes of Rook and the Rook Moments at our website, rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com, where you can also become a patron of our program by pressing support us. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week. The fabulous Keon, Savvy Roham, Thoughtful Nagin, Producer Susan Ponta, The Artist, Ahoy Merdad, Master Muhammad, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you have not done so already. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. And as ever, Mizun Bashi.